they left me a grape. I don't know if I need to explain this or not. But Listen, I, I asked the first service, did they know anybody that was frustrated in life, part of life? Um, and I said I was frustrated because of this. I mean, this thing would just worry you to death. And I'm probably not supposed to be walking around because this is, this is, there's a camera, but this is a strategy of mine. I don't want to be on camera. But frustration, frustration is something that we all have. And it just gets to a point sometimes. And, and by the way, uh, there's more people frustrated now than there were because I let the service out a little bit late. Uh, but you don't have to worry. I got plenty of time this time, I think. <laughs> I told one of my baseball players in my Sunday school class that he has practice at two, he'll be there. But frustration is something that if we want to get rid of it, we've got to do something. We've got to find a way to do something. Because if we don't, frustration has a way of defeating us. And I don't know how many of you came to church this morning defeated, but I guarantee you there's some. There's people that come to work every day defeated, and they can't be their best self. Frustration has a way of just gnawing at you, and eventually it does defeat you. But we have to do something about it. And when you think about doing something about it, Sometimes you have to come up with a strategy. A strategy is easy. You come up, here's what I'm going to do to get rid of my frustration in this part of my life. Or here's what I'm going to do to keep this from happening in my life. You know? You know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? Don't you? Yeah. But then we have to think about, if that's my strategy and I want to do that, then I have to execute the strategy. I have to do the things that's necessary to be able to do what it is I'm set, I've set out to do. And that's difficult. I can't tell you the number of times I've, I've come up with a strategy that I'm going to do these things so that I don't have this frustration in my life. And guess what? I don't do those things. You know why? Circumstances. Circumstances keep me from meeting my strategy of getting rid of something in my life that's going to defeat me if I don't. Circumstances. I don't, I don't have time to do something. I don't know how. I'm really not comfortable doing what it takes to get rid of that frustration. I tell my wife all the time that somebody's going to fall on these stairs, and I'm going to try to be careful because <laughs> I don't want to predict my future. You know what I'm saying? But, hey, circumstances have a way of breeding mediocrity. If I let my circumstances control me and I stay frustrated... Eventually, I'm going to be a mediocre person in every respect, and I don't want that. There's mediocrity in the world, miserable, miserable mediocrity. People are so miserable with their life, and they have no clue what to do, and they're so defeated, misery. But mediocrity is... It's just in the world, and, and listen, I know, you know, and I know that nothing surprises me anymore of what happens. When you turn on the TV and listen to the news, there's only one word for it, and that's crazy. It's just absolutely crazy. But yet, we have to live with it, don't we? Or do we? Our circumstances is a problem. Um, there's just so much stuff, so much going on, and then so many traps. You know what the traps are? It's things, you know, 
the world is constantly recruiting Christians, constantly recruiting good people to this stuff. And for some reason, it looks halfway enticing. And sad to say, some people get mixed up in things that they don't want to get mixed up in. And then the frustration. And then the mediocrity. I have a bookmark in my Bible that it's not one of those bought bookmarks. It's one that I wrote on a piece of paper. And it's a scripture. And and in thinking of the world and thinking of frustration, I, I wrote this verse on there. By the way, this is my favorite verse. Love the Lord my God with all my heart and all my soul and with all my strength. Deuteronomy 6, 5. You know what? I, I think I could have this verse as a strategy. What do you think? That I want to do that 100% of the time. I talked to some people this week, and I asked one, it's just a very strong Christian lady, and I asked her, I said, how many people do you think really live up to that verse? And she said, well, maybe 15%. I want to do that. I want to love the Lord my God with all my heart, all my soul, and all my strength. And do you know what that means? All. Not some. All. You think my circumstances would allow it? Probably not. You know, I can think about times that I felt led to do things. But I didn't. I can think about things in the last month that I felt led to do, and I didn't. Sad but true. Many days I don't feel like a very good Christian. How about you? Of course, I don't have to be perfect. Y'all remember last week's sermon? Brother Mike brought it out clearly. I don't have to be perfect. But I have to be passionate to try to do what I need to do as a Christian. And that's what I, that's my frustration. What I want to do is find a way, find a way to allow God to be greater in my life. have to constantly improve what some people call God awareness. You know, I said in the first service, you know, I'm a lot better when my boss is around. If you ever go to McDonald's, you get better service if the boss is around. You know that? Just, Just watch. If you go anywhere, you get better service if the boss is there or the supervisor, or whatever you want to call it. But what we forget sometimes is God is always watching. God is always with us. And I have to do a better job of uh, my God awareness. I tried to help myself in this regard. And and if, if I want to be, if I want to allow God to be greater in my life, I need to do things differently. And 14 months ago, I did something that I thought was really, really cool. Uh, I took a 30-day challenge to listen to Christian music every day on my radio. My radio stays on it. But I got a 17-year-old back here. If he goes somewhere with us, by the time I get the car cranked, he's up in the front seat pushing a button. You know what I mean? But if he's not in there, my it's on Christian radio, and I try to convince him that that's where it ought to be. But I tried to help myself here, and that was 14 months ago, and I listened to it every day. And it's very positive, very uplifting, very encouraging, and I need that on a daily basis. If I want to find a way to allow God to be greater 
in my life, I need encouragement. And that's one thing that gives it to me. Some songs have a very calming effect when I'm upset, maybe. Some songs fire me up, like the song Courtney sang last week. That song fired me up. I started to come up here and say, can I do it this week? Some songs fire you up, some songs inspire you, and some really challenge me. Sometimes it's a song, it's like the song was written just for me. Just for me. And there's one such song that's called Do Something by Matthew West. Now, I know there's a lot of young people. Not a whole lot of people heard that song in the first service. But I know there's a lot of people that heard it in here. And I'm going to read the, I'm not going to sing. I'm going to read the first verse to you and just listen to what this songwriter says. I woke up this morning, saw a world full of trouble. Thought, how did we ever get this far down? How's it ever going to turn around? So I turned my eyes to heaven, and I thought, God, why don't you do something? If you know the song, you know what comes next. He said, I did. I created you. You have to find a way to do something. And that song encourages me. In John 14, 12, by the way, that's my favorite verse. Whatever I'm reading is my favorite verse. John says, I tell you the truth, and this is Jesus talking, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. That ought to be your favorite verse too. I can do greater things because he's gone to the Father for me. Right? Think about that. Think about that. So it says, if for those that have faith, For those that believe, they're going to do greater things. And here I am standing up here talking about, I want God to be greater in my life, and i got to find a way. And it reminds me, I also have another piece of paper in my Bible that says that I, I read sometimes just to remind myself, and it says, do I really believe that what I believe is real? Is that a legitimate question when sometimes I don't even think I'm that good of a Christian because I'm not doing things the way I should? But I ask myself that, and I always come back to the conclusion that I do believe, absolutely believe. So why should I be having issues doing something greater? As a believer... I need to study God's Word, which I do, to a point. I need to give of my blessings, and God has blessed me, and I I, I should give of my blessings and my talents, and I do, to a point. And I should pray consistently. The Bible says it in so many places. I should pray consistently, and I do, to a point. It's easy to do these things when it's convenient for me. It's easy to do it in Sunday school. It's easy to do it in our Sunday night Bible study. It's easy to do it. But what not easy is to sacrificially give up my time. Can you believe that? That's my circumstances. What am I going to give up to do these things more? If I'm going to allow him to be greater in my life, I've got to do this stuff, and I want to do this stuff. But things keep getting in the way. But I want to tell you what to a point means. Here's the definition of to a point. 
It means greater is certainly a possibility for Wayne. That's what it means. After thinking about it, my biggest challenge is not how bad the world is. It's about doing what I believe and finding a way to do it greater. Again, I need to allow God to do something greater within me and everything, everything starts with an improved prayer life. Everything. Luke addressed prayer in his gospel. He, he, he addressed the prayer and the life of Jesus in his gospel more than any other gospel writer. In fact, it's one of the primary themes in Luke. If you read Luke, you're going to see all the time it's talking about prayer. It leads to prayer. Luke the physician, the Gentile companion of Paul who wrote this gospel in the book of Acts his relationship with Paul his interaction with others as well as his use of first hand accounts of Jesus' ministry allowed him to research thoroughly and to report accurately he was a man of detail and accuracy was highly important to him because he claimed to have written this book so that his reader, me and you, his reader would be able to have absolute confidence in the things that had been taught about Jesus. In Acts, he continued writing to show that the gospel that Jesus taught in Luke, or preached in Luke, was preached to the ends of the earth as Christ had commanded at the end. Although prayer is made up a great part of the Jewish life, it was notably regimented, it was notably ritualistic, rarely did people make up their own prayers. They prayed according to traditions, pr prescribed prayers of the temple and the synagogue, and they were often composed by religious leaders and rabbis. But by his own example, Jesus taught his disciples the necessity of prayer. Luke made it apparent throughout the gospel that prayer was primary in the life of Jesus. His emphasis upon the need to be alone with the Father must have made a tremendous impact on the lives of his followers, prompting one to request Jesus to teach them to pray. Teach me to pray. That's a great request. And it's something that we have right in front of us, right in front of us. Of course, he had Jesus, and Jesus did teach in, in Luke 11. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. But I need, Jesus, teach me to pray. Because I want, to, I want you to be greater in my life. In verse 2, chapter 11, after the disciple had asked Jesus to teach them to pray, Jesus said, when you pray. He didn't say, if you pray. He said, when you pray, denoting it should be a way of life. Right after Jesus offers instructions to the disciples, the Lord's Prayer in Luke 11, Luke 9 says, so I say to you, ask, and it will be, get, by the way, this is my favorite scripture. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be open." Now, we've read that hundreds of times in our life. But do we really understand what it means? Let me tell you what it means to me. God is rich in his desire to relate to us, to relate to me. 
His desire is that his people would seek him through communication to know his heart. And to share, he wants me to share my heart with him. And the more I do that, the more I get to know him. Great relationships are forged with great communication. The more I know him, the more I talk to him, the more I communicate with him, the more I'm going to be able to hear him. And he talks to us. And I'm going to give you some examples of that in my personal life in a minute, but uh, it's just important. By relating to God in this way, I come to know him so good. His heart, his purposes, his desire for me. This way I can begin to reflect his desires in my day-to-day living. Wow. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't I get closer to being able to 100% of the time love my Lord with all my heart? All my strength? If I have communication like I should. Prayer would then become the essence of my daily life in relationship to God, just as it was modeled in the life of Christ. To think that I have been given the opportunity. I ain't talking about me. You can put your name here if you want to, but to think that I have been given the opportunity to communicate And have a relationship with the creator of the universe is awesome. I mean, think about that for a minute. Think about it. He has chosen to open his mind. Ask, and you will receive. Knock, and the door will be open. Wow. And you know what? If I'm talking to him the way I'm supposed to and I'm developing this relationship, I know what to ask for. Do I even recognize the implications of this? I'm sitting here talking about I want God to be greater in my life. And now I'm talking about prayer that I ought to be doing without question. Could this be another strategy, having a better prayer life? You want to talk about something greater? Prayer becoming the essence of my daily life in relationship to God? I think I just found the way. (laughs) I just found a way for Him to be greater in my life, and that's through prayer. Doing what they've, it's in scripture. It's in music. Now let me tell you about some personal experiences. I, I, I had a hard time getting through this this morning because it is very, very close to my heart. But, you know, I, I started out with an easy one and thought that was going to help, but it didn't. At age 13, I knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that I needed to call on Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. No question. But for some reason, I keep telling my wife how shy I was when I was young, and she says, what? For some reason, I didn't want to walk the aisle. I was just scared of it. And it was a tiny church. The aisle wasn't as long as this. If I had to walk this one at age 13, oh my goodness. But think about it. You probably have this too. But my Sunday school teacher, I'm just going to call him old dude. And that's sad because I'm going to show you in a minute I'm the old dude in my class now. He says, I know your heart, Wayne. I know what you feel. Why have you not stepped forward? I just said, I don't know. I, I plan on doing it. And he said, well, I tell you what, I'm going to pray that something will happen in your life that will make it easy for you to walk the aisle. I didn't think much about it. About two weeks later, 
one of my friends said, hey, dude, we're going to have a basketball team here at the church, but you have to be a member to play. I walked the aisle. <laughs> but I knew why I was. <laughs> and, and what's so funny? And I'll leave this to your thinking. We never had a basketball team. Never, ever. But the old dude prayed that something was going to happen in my life to make it easy for me, and it worked. Same church when I was a young guy, just starting my career. Pretty good church. My parents went there. It was special to me. I was there, and we got this new pastor. And he came in with all these new ideas, and he was very energetic, and he says, we're going to grow this church. And you know what? I, my circumstances told me, yeah, right. <laughs> but he started doing things. And one thing to just show what I'm talking about here is that he said, we're going to have, we're going to pray. We're going to be a praying church. We, we're going to have a prayer meeting on Saturday night at 11 o'clock. A year later, our attendance had grown double what it was. We baptized over 100 people in that church when it was less than 20 every year before. It works. It works. And there's another situation. I, I Probably uh, one of the worst days of my life, I have to go. My mom had been real sick. And it got to the point my father couldn't, my dad couldn't take care of her. So I had to, I had to do something. And, of course, I, being the oldest, I had to go get my mom. And I'd already made arrangements, my sister and I, to put my mom in a nursing home. And it was a very, very difficult day. And my dad and my mom had been together over 50 years. And to take my mom, to take her there, it upset my dad extremely. And it upset me. One of the worst days of my life. So that day we get her taken care of, and I go home, and I hadn't talked to anybody. But I get a phone call. And a friend of mine on the other side, on the other end of the phone, says, I don't know why, but you've been on my heart. And I just want to let you know I'm praying for you. can't tell you there's no words possible to tell you how much that meant to me how did he know because he had a greater prayer life he knew he does it all the time I can't tell you the number of times he's called me when I was just kind of having a down day said, just want to let you know I love you, brother. Praying for you. He did that last night, too. He's saying through music. Well, let me tell you one more story. At work, about three or four weeks ago, we were having a training session with a little over 20 people. And... There was a young lady in there that was having cancer surgery the next day. And it, 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 was, it was just not a, it was not a good training session, to be honest with you. She wanted to be there. She wanted to be there. And you could tell everybody was worried and thinking about that. And that afternoon, I got up to do a part, and, I, and the Lord just led me. He said, look. I said, look, we're going to call a timeout here. We're not at work anymore. We're on break. And if you have a trouble with what we're about to do, you can walk out of the room and there'll be no problems with it. But we had prayer for this young lady. And I asked, uh, I asked Joe Andrew, who goes to church here. Y'all know he's he's... He works with me, and uh, he was in there that day, and I asked him to voice the prayer. And, and Joe is, is pretty good at prayer. 
But that day, it was awesome. And the Holy Spirit grabbed that room. It made a big difference. He's saying to me through music, through scripture, my personal experiences, Wayne, you can do something greater. It's not out there somewhere. It's inside of you. It's already there. But just like when I was 13, I need boldness. Let me talk about that for a minute. In the first few chapters of Acts, the early church was growing. Things were happening. Um, but it was being severely challenged. People were being threatened. Peter and John had been arrested. But upon their release, they went back to the believers, their own people, and reported all the chief priests and, and elders had said to them, and it wasn't good. The believers knew that they were in trouble, that there was going to be a problem. And the easiest thing to do because of their circumstances would be to just give it up. They didn't give it up. Acts 4.23, my favorite chapter, my favorite verse. Y'all getting it now, aren't you? On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. Verse 24, when they heard this, they raised their voices in prayer to God. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. They didn't care about the threats. Their situation was tough. They raised their voices in prayer and it made a difference. It would make a difference for me as well. It would make a difference for you. I've been a believer most of my life, as you know. But I think, why in the world do I flounder sometimes? Why can't I be more consistent in communicating and getting closer to God, allowing Him to be greater in my life? When I think about that, I remind myself of a couple of statements in a book I read some years ago that expressed my concern. Some of you probably have read it from several years ago, but it's fresh wind, fresh fire. Page 27 says, If we call upon the Lord, He has promised in His Word to answer to bring the unsaved to himself, to pour out his spirit among us. If we don't call upon the Lord, he has promised nothing. Nothing at all. It's as simple as that. No matter what we claim to believe in our heads, the future depends on our time of prayer. And then page 58, 59 of the same book says, What about heaven? He is the center of everything there. If I don't enjoy being in his presence here and now, I'm just saying. It goes on to say, why would he send anyone there who doesn't long for him passionately here on earth? The author says he's not suggesting that we are justified by acts of prayer or any other acts of devotion, but we should not dodge the issue of what heaven will be like. Enjoying the presence of God, taking time to love Him, listening to Him, and giving Him praise. The only difference is we're not going to have circumstances there. Circumstances here keep me from doing that. But not as much as it used to. He's telling me to find a way to improve my prayer life. And I need fresh wind and fresh fire. So what should I do? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What about my circumstances? Well, I'm starting to talk about it now. What should I do? What about my circumstances? What am I going to do with them? God allowed me to hear what I consider a great speaker two times over the last year or so. And he drove home to me, and it was very inspiring. He drove home that as a human being, I make a choice every day. 
I choose to live with my circumstances and let them affect everything I try to do. Everything. Marriage, family relationships, everything. Work. Or I choose to live with vision in spite of my circumstances and set goals and do things and find a way to do what I need to do. No longer am I going to allow my circumstances to defeat me. And that's what we have to do. That's what we have to get to. You want to talk frustration? If you can't get to that point, you're going to be so frustrated. But you know what? Sometimes my circumstances include me thinking I'm good enough. I am good enough. And that, I think, is a bigger problem. One thing I know for a fact is that good is the enemy of great. If I think I'm good, why change? Regardless of how good I think I am in any area of my life, I need to allow God to do something greater in me. And since I can talk to God any time and he desires it, here's what I need to do. First of all, now I warned these guys that I was going to do this. I need my class to stand up if all of you are still awake. <laughs> here they are. Now I got some over here too. <laughs> That's my 17, and sitting by him is my 17-year-old grandson. You can stand up too back there. You see these guys? These guys are hit every day. Every day. They have to be on their toes. And I pray for them. But I don't pray enough. And I will. Y'all can sit down now. I know y'all have enjoyed that. Y and now you know why I said I'm the old dude in my class now. Yeah. Somebody said, now listen, when y'all get up in this situation when you get older, don't say there was some old dude that taught my class. You remember, okay? I'm going to pray for these guys. And you know what? You need to. You know, you don't even see these guys a lot unless you pay attention until they're graduating from high school, and then they come up here. Isn't that right? They'll be up here, because some of them will be up here in a few months, and we may not see them again for a while. If at all, we need to pray for these guys. We need to pray for all of our youth. We need to pray for Brother Mike. Hey, listen, me and Brother Mike have one thing in common. I didn't say this in the first service, but I'm going to say it now. Me, there's a lot of people in my work call me Brother Wayne. It's true. We need to pray more for our leaders. Listen. Just think what we could do if everybody in this room raised their level of their prayer life. You sh you, do you think we could shake this building? Do you think we could get rid of some frustration? Do you think we could get rid of some circumstances? And let's talk about circumstances. If we, if we did the... If we had a better prayer life, some of our circumstances wouldn't even be a circumstance because we made a poor decision back then. Now we got to live with our decisions. Prayer life is so important, and I've challenged myself, and I challenge you as well. Do you know the power of prayer? Do you know he's the only one that can do something about our circumstances? I know some of you are good, but you can do better. You can be greater for him. Some of you are struggling. Some of you have circumstances that is just far beyond where it needs to be. And some of you are just stuck in old bad habits. I challenge you to allow God to do things greater inside of you. Especially to become a prayer warrior for Eastmont, its members and its staff. Let's find a way to 
find opportunities to be used by God to touch lives. It's like I was talking about a while ago. I just can't tell you how important it was when somebody called me and said, I don't know why, but I prayed for you today. Be part of something greater. It's not easy, but it's possible. Jesus himself said it. If you have faith in me, you're going to do greater things than I did. That doesn't mean we're going to be greater than Jesus. He's just helping us do greater things because he went to the Father. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to end on this. You're going to get to lunch on Sunday. The last verse of the song, Do Something, reads, I'm so tired of talking about how we're God's hands and feet. But it's easier to say than to be. We live like angels of apathy. We tell ourselves, it's all right. Somebody else will do something. That's what the preacher gets paid for. Somebody else will do it. That's a circumstance as well. It goes on to say, well, I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of life with no desire. I don't want a flame. I want a fire. I want to be one who stands up and says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to find a way. God is so much greater than we're allowing him to be through us. In the end, all that matters is continuously improving our relationship with the King of Kings. He died on the cross not for me to go to church. He died on the cross for me to be the church. So no matter what I do as a church member, I have to find a way to allow God to be greater within me. And I hope you feel the same way. Let's pray. Father, I just can't tell you how much I love you. I pray for wisdom. I pray for courage. I pray for opportunity. I pray to allow you to be greater in me. Thank you, Father, for all my blessings. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.